ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋ ಗುಣಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವಿಹಿರ್ಯಂಕರವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀರಮಸ್ತು ಮಾಷಾವಹೈ ಶಾಂತಿಶಾಂತಿ ಪೂರ್ಣಮದ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಿದ ಪೂರ್ಣಾತ್ ಪೂರ್ಣಮುಗಕ್ಷತೆ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾಧಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯತೆ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಶ್ರುತಿಸ್ಮೃತಿಪುರಾಲಯ ಕರುಣಾಲಯ ನಮಿ ಭಗವತ್ಪಾದ ಶಂಕರ ಲೋಕಶಂಕರ ಶಂಕರ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಕೇಶವಂ ವಾದರಾಯಣ ಸೂತ್ರಭಾಷ್ಯಂದೇ ಭಗವಂತೋರೋ ಗುರುರಾತ್ಮೇ ಮೂರ್ತಿ ಭೇದ ವಿಭಾಗಿಣೆ ವ್ಯೋಮವ್ಯಾಪ್ತೇಹಾಯ ದಕ್ಷಿಣಾಮೂರ್ತ ನಮಃ ಗುಕಾರಸ್ವಂದಕಾರೋ ವೈ ಋಕಾರಸ್ತನ್ನಿವರ್ತಕ ಅಂಧಕಾರ ನಿರೋಧಿ ಗುರುರಿತ್ಯಭಿಧೀಯತೆ ಸದಾ ಶಿವ ಸಾರಂಭ ಶಂಕರಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಮಧ್ಯಮ ಅಸ್ಮದಾಚಾರ್ಯ ಪರ್ಯಂತ ವಂದೇ ಗುರು ಪರಂಪರಾತಿ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ವರ್ಸಸ್ ಕರ್ತುರಾಜ್ಞೆಯ ಪ್ರಾಪ್ಯತೆ ಫಲ ಕರ್ಮ ಕಂ ಪರಂ ಕರ್ಮ ತಜ್ಜಡ ಕೃತಿಮಹೋದಧೌ ಪತನ ಕಾರಣ ಫಲಮ ಶಾಶ್ವತ ಗತಿ ನಿರೋಧಕ ಚಿತ್ತಶೋಧಕ ಮುಕ್ತಿ ಸಾಧಕ ಕಾಯವಾಂಗ್ಮನ ಕಾರ್ಯಮುತ್ತಮ ಚಿತ್ತಜಂಜಪಿಂತನ ಕ್ರಮ ಪೂಜನ ಜಪಿಂತನ ಕ್ರಮ ಪೂಜನ ಜಗತ ಈಷಧೀಯುಕ್ತ ಸೇವನ ಅಷ್ಟಮೂರ್ತಿಭೃದೇವಪೂಜನ ಉತ್ತಮಸ್ತವಾದುಚ್ಚಮಂದತ ಚಿತ್ತಜಂಜಪ್ಯಾನಮುತ್ತಮ ಚಿತ್ತಜಂಜಪ 
ಆಜ್ಯಧಾರೋತಸಾಸನಂ ಸರಲಚಿಂತನ ವಿರಲತರ ಶ್ರವಣ ಮಹರ್ಷಿ ಡಿಸ್ಕಸ್ ದಿ ಕರ್ಮಯೋಗ ದರ್ಡ್ ವರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಮಹರ್ಷಿ ಸಹಿತ ಈಶ್ವರಾರ್ಪಿತ ನಿಶ್ಚಯಾಕೃತ ಚಿತ್ತಶೋಧಕ ಮುಕ್ತಿ ಸಾಧಕ when you perform your action when you perform your duty duty means doing what is right to do in a given situation in different situations you play different roles and there is generally a a proper or an <coughs> appropriate way to respond to that situation what is right against what is convenient meaning that i avoid as best as i can what is convenient and do what is right <coughs> and that too is done ishwararpitam in the spirit of offering or worship to the lord meaning that i invoke the devotee from within myself and perform the action whatever it is in the spirit of devotion or offering to the lord so one maharshi suggested or prescribed what we should be doing in our daily practice to help us invoke the devotee so now comes bhakti that this is the three fold way we can make offering to the lord karyavang mana karya muttamam that the worship can you perform with the limbs can you perform with the speech can you perform by the mind although when you perform the worship with the limbs the speech and mind also get involved when we perform worship with speech such as such as reciting a hymn reciting his name reciting a mantra either loudly or slowly or mentally poojanam japa hai chintanam so as we see the japa hai or the action at the level of speech you know requires more concentration than the action performed at the level of body and the action performed purely at the level of mind in was much more concentration therefore this sequence is prescribed here that as we become adept in being able to focus our mind on worship then we take up the next next level of worshiping or at the level of speech as we become adept in that we take up the next level of worshiping at the level of mind the mental worship uttam devar ramana maharshi says that each following were each following one is superior to the previous one naturally because they did was more concentration more focus and therefore is more effective <coughs> effective in terms of in terms of the ability to concentrate the mind <clears throat> focus the mind purify the mind <clears throat> so this should be karyam karyavang mana karyam I means should be done 
karyam can be said to be action or something should be done. Then Ramana Maharshi said, what can be done at the physical level? Jagataha ishadi yuga, jagataha sevanam. Serving the jagat, serving the world. With the attitude that the world is the manifestation of the Lord. And traditionally, Lord is said to manifest in eightfold forms the five elements, the sun, which stands for all the luminaries, the moon, which stands for all the planets and the conscious being. So, worshipping world as the expression of Lord in this eightfold form. <coughs> at the level of speech, Uttamastavad, Uchamandataha, Chittavnyam Japadhyanam Uttama. First level is Tava, the reciting of hymns, reciting of prayers, singing the glories of the Lord. Singing the glories is conducive to discovering our reverence and devotion for the Lord. More we know the glories, more the reverence and the devotion is invoked. Then comes the chanting of the, the loud chanting of a mantra or a name or even as we did last night, a bhajan or a dhun. Then comes the slow chanting. Then comes the chanting at the level of the mind. There also one practice makes us adapt for the next stage which makes us adapt for the subsequent stage. <coughs> How should that mental worship be? Mental worship can be meditation upon a form of your choice. You can meditate upon formless whatever you choose. Worship is performed. What is worship is? That my mind enjoys. The attitude or spirit of devotion. And the object of meditation is such that invokes the devotion from me. The object of meditation should be pleasing to me. Should be inspiring to me. Therefore, we can make our own choice. As I said, in the Hindu tradition of worship, a number of forms are provided and one can choose among them or whatever it is that one is pleased with. The idea of Lord is important. So many symbols are provided. Like a Shivalinga, which is a symbol for Lord Shiva. Like a Shaligrama, symbol for Lord Vishnu. Or it can be a Pratima, it can be an image representing the Lord. It can be just a, a name. It is not that you to meditate on a form, just meditate. Repeating a name, or repeating a mantra, Om Namah Shiva. My salutations to Lord Shiva. Om Namo Narayanaya. My salutations to Lord Narayana. Or, as our Swami used to say, Om Ishaya Namaha. So it does not involve any particular Devata. Om Ishaya Namaha. My salutations to Ishwara. Whatever my concept of Ishvara is. So certainly, the mental worship requires acceptance of Ishvara. Without that, there, without Ishvara, there cannot be worship. Worship means worshipping Ishvara. And worship does involve a duality of the worshipper and what is worshipped that Duality is involved. And we accept that duality for the time being. Because that is 
in keeping with whatever present experience is. So this worship in the realm of duality becomes a means of progressively helping us to grow out of duality. So worship, the purpose of worship is the absorption of the mind. Absorption of the mind in the object of worship, in, 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 in Ishwara. Therefore, what I meditate upon should be absorbing to my mind, pleasing to my mind. Something that invokes a devotee from within me. Therefore, you choose a name, you choose a mantra, you choose a form, you choose what you like that invokes the devotee from within ourselves. So that then I can maintain the spirit of devotion. So when I meditate or when I repeat mentally or when I perform any act of devotion, it is the devotee who is doing that with devotion. Thus the most important in worship is the spirit of devotion. And therefore, it does not matter what form you worship or formless you worship or what you worship or what you meditate upon. What is important is the spirit of devotion. What I meditate upon invokes from me a devotee. And that will vary with different people. What inspires one may not inspire someone else which doesn't matter. Here, therefore, there are many paths, you may say, meaning that there are, that everybody has the freedom to worship Ishwara in whichever way he or she prefers. <coughs> the idea is, the mental worship is to focus the attention. Meditation is called Sajatya Vritti Pravaha, maintaining a flow of thoughts of the same kind, maintaining a flow of thoughts of the same kind. Thus, if I am repeating a mantra such as Om Namah Shivaya, then Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. Thus, every thought is the same form. Sajati Ajati means the, 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 the type. So every form, every thought is the same type. And maintaining that thought flow is called meditation. Sajatya Vritti Pravaha. Maintaining a thought flow of the same kind. With the same object. Is the, is the goal of meditation. In course of time, as we will see, that meditation then becomes effortless. In the beginning, meditation or concentrating the mind involves effort, maybe a lot of effort. But in course of time, the the need for the effort reduces and it becomes effortless. Therefore, in the seventh verse, Ravana Maharshi mentioned both of these things. The second line, Sarala Chintanam Viralatav Param. Viralatah, with broken meditation, with disturbed meditation. Thus, in the beginning, we find that the mind does get distracted. The mind in the beginning does not find that same satisfaction or gratification from meditation. And therefore, the mind has a tendency to run towards what provides gratification. Point is that the mind is seeking gratification. So far, the mind is accustomed to Finding gratification from the objects of pleasure. 
Now we provide the mind an alternate means of gratification, which is the worship of the Lord. And worship in duality is where we begin and that is easier because it is in keeping with the present state of our mind. And therefore, the devotee makes his or her worship as interesting as possible. Therefore, typically in the temple or at our altar, you, you offer a variety of things to the Lord and make that worship as interesting to you as you can. So somebody likes to chant, do, enjoys chanting. So you do the chanting while you are offering bath to the Lord. Somebody enjoys decoration. Then you offer a variety of garments, variety of ornaments. Somebody enjoys the archana, offering the flowers. Then you utter the hundred names, hundred eight names, three hundred names, one thousand eight names. So all these choices are there. <clears throat> Which particular step can be elaborated is up to you. And so important thing is that what I do is interesting to the mind. So that the mind gets some rasa out of that, gets some pleasure out of that. We need to provide an alternative source of pleasure to the mind. Because mind wants pleasure. The reason why our mind, the reason why we find it difficult to focus our mind is because the mind in the beginning does not get the pleasure from thinking or meditating or repeating the name. Therefore, it gets distracted. And therefore, it involves a struggle, it involves an effort. Which effort we have to make. Fake it till you make it. As our Swamiji's story of this bitter gourd, Karala, is very famous. And once upon a time, Swamiji was giving a series of talks in Delhi, morning and evening. The first night, Swamiji was invited for bhiksha, for dinner. And the hostess has prepared many dishes. One of them is the sabji of karela, of bitter gourd, because Punjabis are very fond of that. So these different dishes are served. And Swamiji does not like bitter gourd, because it is bitter. But his approach is, deal with the unpleasant first, so that you are left with pleasant. Therefore, he finished that bitter gourd, Karala, so that he can enjoy the other sabjis later. But the hostess was watching and saw that Swami has finished that quickly, so thought Swami must like this and therefore another file pay. In India, they don't even ask you, they just serve you. Now, if Swami cannot say, I don't like it, it's not right. You should welcome, gracefully accept what comes. So, he gracefully accepted and finished the second helping also. And the third helping also. We did not stop there. Next day for lunch, Swamiji was invited in some other place. And when you invite a Swami, you want to know what the Swami likes. <laughs> Therefore, the hostess there checks with the hostess for the, in the earlier viksha. What did Swamiji like? Oh, he loves bitter God. <laughs> so thus, this became, you know, from one hostess to the other. And there were Wherever Swami went, morning and evening, for 15 days, he was greeted with bitter gore. 
ಮದುವೆ ಲೈಕ್ ಇಟ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ಕೊಳ್ಳ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಅರ್ಜುನ ಇಸ್ ಆಸ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಎಟ್ ಒನ್ ಪಾಯಿಂಟ್ ಹೌ ಡು ಐ ಕಾನ್ಸಂಟ್ರೇಟ್ ಮೈ ಮೈಂಡ್ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸೇಸ್ ದ ಅಭ್ಯಾಸ ಅಂಡ್ ವೈರ್ ಆಗಿ ಬೈ ರಿಪೀಟೆಡ್ಲಿ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ದ ಸೇಮ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಐ ಎಮ್ ಕಲ್ಟಿವೇಟಿಂಗ್ ಅನ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಇನ್ ದಾ ಸೊ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ಈಟಿಂಗ್ ಕಾರಣ ಬಿಟ್ರ ಗೋಲ್ ಫಾರ್ ಫಿಫ್ಟೀನ್ ಡೇಸ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಈವ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಜೀಸ್ ಹಿ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ಲೈಕಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ So similarly, we make our mind go to the object of meditation, whether it likes it or not. And do it long enough. So repeatedly doing it through Abhyasa. And Vairagya means taking interest in that. Giving up interest in other things and taking interest in that. <clears throat> you can always take interest in the object of a meditation. again if you are raised in this hindu tradition then you have a chosen deity such as lord krishna rama ganesha fortunately there are huge puranas about every deity and purana sing the glories of the lord of that deity so ganesha puranam sings the glories of lord ganesha shiva puranam sings the glories of lord shiva Vishnu Puranam sings the glory of Lord Vishnu. And therefore, read those things. Listen to the glories of the Lord. Shravanam. Kirtanam sings the glories of the Lord. Smaranam, then remember. So this, listening to the glories of the Lord, singing His glories, remembering His glories, is conducive to discovering the shraddha and bhakti the shraddha the faith and devotion for the lord when that devotion you meditate again do that so keep listening keep repeating keep singing and keep meditating it's a whole package meditation is a whole package it in all the commitment on our part and doing whatever is necessary to enjoy that process of meditation <clears throat> so virala chintanam in the beginning naturally the chintanam the meditation is interrupted because the mind has not yet discovered adequate pleasure in the act of meditating as the mind discovers is not merely a mechanical process that you keep on forcing your mind to do something important that you should discover interest so meditation should not be merely a mechanical thing or forcing the mind but it should involve also rasa should involve the interest and we have to do what is required to cultivate that interest therefore they prescribe shravanam listening to the glories of the lord kirtanam singing the glories of the lord smaranam remembering his glories he said that this knowing more and more the glories of the lord mahatma gyana purvastu sudrudo sarvatodhikah sneha bhakte te khyat what is bhakti what is devotion sneha affection devotion love is called bhakti love for the lord so love that is right now scattered in number of things of the world has to be directed to the lord and that happens by doing the mahatmya the glories the greatness of the lord what you know the grace of the lord the, the greatness of the lord more and more we you know more and more our mind gets attached to that so thus cultivating an attachment for the lord that is a way to make the mind detached from the world because the mind needs some attachment 
mind cannot function without attachment. Although Vedanta keeps on telling us, give up attachment, give up attachment. The mind always needs attachment. Therefore, we give, provide the mind a desirable object of attachment. The attachment that the mind has for the world is a binding attachment makes me dependent, makes me addicted, binds me to them. If we provide an alternative object of attachment, which is Lord, Ishvara. And generally speaking, form and name are easier to meditate upon than without the formless and nameless, but it's a matter of choice. So develop the attachment, more attachment we develop, Easier it is to meditate. Because mind naturally wants to dwell upon that which it likes. So as it starts liking the object of meditation, starts liking that form of the Lord, it wants to dwell more and more upon that. Sarala chintanam, viralatav param. This is the beginning, chintanam or meditation which is interrupted becomes less and less interrupted and ultimately becomes uninterrupted. So until then, one should keep on practicing meditation. This meditation is of the nature of mental worship, understand. It is not a meditation upon the self. It will come later. Right now we are discussing bhakti or devotion. Therefore, this is the meditation upon Ishwara, with form or without form, whatever is your choice. <clears throat> so, having described the meditation in general, in the next verse now, Ramana Maharshi gives some sp- specific attitude for meditation. What is a desirable attitude while meditating? That is what is described in the verse number 8. Bhed bhavana soha mitya Bhavana Bhida Pavani Mata Bhida Bhavana Bhida means duality. Technically, Bhida means Anyonya Abhava. What is duality? The two does not make duality. Mutual exclusion makes duality. Veda means mutual exclusion. What one is, the other is not. What other is, one is not. That is called mutual exclusion. For example, a part is a part, possesses partness. A cloth is a cloth, possesses clothness. So, what is partness is not clothness. What is clothness is not partness, right? What is chairness is not tableness. What is tableness is not chairness. Therefore, what the table is, the chair is not. And what the chair is, table is not, right? It is that which enables us to identify table as a table and a chair as a chair. Because table possesses tableness. Chair possesses chairness. Thus, in technical language, we can say that the table excludes the chair. Meaning that what the table is, the chair is not. And chair excludes the table. Meaning, what the chair is, the table is not. This is called mutual exclusion. Anyonya abhavah. Mutual exclusion. Each one excludes the other. Meaning that in the idea of chair, there is no table. In the idea of chair, there is chairness. Tableness is absent. 
in the idea of table, table needs to say chairness is absent. You understand? So suppose you are thinking of chair. Then there is the thought of chair possessing chairness. Now suppose a thought of table comes. It completely displaces the chairness and establishes tableness. So chairness has displaced the table. Chair, tableness displaces the chairness. One displacing the other is called mutual exclusion. It, this is not always the case. For example, there are several ornaments of gold. It is a bangle. It is an earring. It is a necklace. So, thought of bangle is bangleness. Then, when you think of earring, there is earringness. Think of necklace, necklaceness, let us say. So each thought seems to exclude the other one. But think of gold. The Bengal does not exclude gold because in the idea of Bengal, the idea of gold is involved. Is that right? The earring does not include exclude gold because in the idea of earring, gold is involved. So two does not make duality. Mutual exclusion makes duality. See, this should be understood. So even if there are two, if you can find something that is common to them, and focus your attention on that, then two does not make duality. Thus there is a bangle and there is a necklace. As long as the attention is in the name and form, so long bangle is one thing, necklace is another thing. However, if we pay attention to the gold, which is common to both the bangle and the necklace, then gold is not excluded by bengal or necklace. Then we see that bengal and necklace are not separate, totally separate from each other. There is goldness in them. So focusing attention on goldness enables us to see the non-oneness or even non-duality of bengal and necklace. When we look upon them as gold. Similarly, Bheda Bhava. So, Bheda Bhavana is focusing attention on names and forms. Upon what distinguishes one from the other. A Bheda Bhavana or this, the attitude of non-duality is focusing attention on that which is common to them. So we have the choice to meditate upon an ornament, in which case one ornament will displace the other ornament, or the choice to meditate upon gold, which is not excluded by any ornament. So gold is equally present in all the ornaments. It is not excluded by any ornament. That's called Veda, the non-duality. So Vedanta teaches us non-duality in spite of duality. That yes, we do experience duality. We experience variety. We experience diversity. We experience disparity. But in all variety, in all diversity, in all disparity, there is something that is not excluded. That's what Vedanta teaches that there is something that is not excluded by anything. And that is the truth of everything. Just as gold is not excluded by any ornament. Therefore, gold is the truth of the ornament. So you have a choice whether to meditate upon ornament, which is your choice, or to meditate upon gold. 
Now here we are talking about two entities, not bangle and necklace. Both are different from me. Here we are talking about two entities. Which are they? The meditator and what is meditated upon. The meditator in Sanskrit is called Dhyata. Dhyayi means to meditate. From that is derived the word Dhyata, the meditator. Dhyaya, the object of meditation. Dhyanam, meditation. All from one root, Dhyayi, means to meditate. Depending upon which suffix we apply, the meaning changes. It's so with all language, but it is very convenient with Sanskrit. So, trish pratyay apply becomes dhyata, meditator, agent. Dhyaya, what is meditated upon? The object of meditation. Dhyanam, the act of meditation. So, usually, in meditation, I meditate upon a given name or a form. So, I have the status of meditator and the name and form upon which I meditate is what is meditated upon. Dhyata and Dhyaya, meditator and the object of meditation. So, usually they are different. So, thus when I meditate upon something, when I look upon the object of meditation as different from me, I look upon myself as different from that. So I meditate upon Lord Krishna. No, where is Krishna? Where is I? Krishna is beautiful. He is all love. He is all freedom. He is all joy. He is the manifestation of wholeness, completeness. Lord Krishna is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. All of these are described in the Bhagavatam, you know. Who am I? I am a, an entity limited in every way. So this is my perception about myself and my perception about Lord Krishna. <coughs> Thus, when I, when I think of Lord Krishna, Suddenly, the thought of I is not there because I is different from Krishna. In the limitless, the limited is not there. I am limited. Therefore, I is excluded when I thought, think of Krishna. This is the usual way of meditation. <coughs> That's how we begin. Where I look upon the Lord or the object of meditation as different from me. Because it facilitates it. It invokes a devotion from me. When I think of the Lord as all grace, as all joy, as all love, then it becomes possible for me to invoke the devotion, to invoke the devotee from me. That is the meditation involving the attitude or spirit of duality. Usually, that's the usual meditation, usual mental worship. Here, Ramana Maharshi, being what he is, says, Bhed Bhavana. So, by the Bhavana or attitude of Bhed or duality, what's the duality? Ishwara is different, I am different. There are many statements in, you know, Anyo hamasmiti, anyo anyas, anyo so, anyo hamasmiti. He is different, I am different. That is the Bheda Bhavana, that is the attitude or spirit of duality, mutual exclusion. As compared to that, Ramachit is Bhavana, Bhida, Abhida Bhavana. Again, Bhid means to divide, Bhida means division, Abhida means non-division, Bhida means duality, Abhida means non-duality. Same root, but different forms depending upon the meter, etc. You know. 
So, bhed bhavanat, abhida bhavet, bhavana is a feminine word. Therefore, abhida bhavana, abhida also is feminine. The, in Sanskrit, there is you no know, visheshana or adjective, takes the same gender and same case as the substantive. So, bhavana is substantive. Abhida is the adjective. So, bhavana is feminine. And which case is it? Nominative case. Singular, dual, plural. What is it? Singular. So, bhavana is nominative, singular. Therefore, the adjective abhida also should be in nominative, singular. Abhida bhavana. Bhavana means spirit, attitude here. Abhida means non-dual. So, attitude of non-duality. Bhed bhavana. Fifth case, bhavanat, you know. As compared to bhed bhavana, as compared to the attitude of duality, abhida bhavana, the attitude of non-duality. What is that non-duality? Sohamiti. So, Ramana Maharshi describes here, what is the non- attitude of non-duality? Soham. Saham means he, aham means I, he, I am. He stands for the Lord, I stand for myself. Soham. Same with aham Brahma Asmi, I am Brahman. Express in other words, soham, that I am. That bhavana, that attitude, that spirit, Ramana Maharshi says, is better. Meaning that, always keep in mind, even when you are functioning in the realm of duality, and accepting the duality as it exists for me right now, Still, I do not give reality to the duality. I know that right now you are different from me. That is my perception. That Ishwara is different. That's what I feel. <clears throat> but within myself, I know that that is not the ultimate reality. What's the ultimate reality? That what you are is what I am. Soham, what the Lord is, is what I am. How can you, Swami? Where is Lord and where are you? Where is Lord Krishna? Where is, where is Ishwara? Omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent? And where are you? Limited in knowledge, in every way you are limited. How can this limited, insignificant entity be one, same as Lord? How can it be? Thus, there appears to be a total contradiction between the Lord and myself. Saha and Aham. Saha means he, Aham means I, appears to be a total contradiction. Like that between a mountain and a little pebble. Like that between the ocean and a little wave. Like that between gold and the ornament. Seems to be, oh, it's very the ocean. Boundless. Very little, very wave, small little thing. Is born now, exists for a while, gets destroyed. That's wave, impermanent, limited, in time, in place, in everywhere. Very ocean, free from all limitations. How can wave and ocean be one? They cannot be one as long as wave continues to think itself from the standpoint of its name and form, that I am so much only. But if the wave shifts its focus from the name and form to the content, and the content of wave is water, is it not so? Wave is made up of water. Take a sample from the wave, it is H2O. Take a sample from the ocean, it is H2O. Therefore, as far as 
the content is concerned, or in Vedanta, as far as Swarupa is concerned, one's true nature is concerned. The wave and ocean are not different from each other. So, wave can say that I am the same as Soham. Saha is ocean. Aham is wave. Soham. I am ocean. Not in terms of arrogance, not in terms of ego. In terms of reality, when that wave has shifted its focus of attention, the I-ness of the wave is shifted from the name and form to the content, which is water. Similarly, I also shift my focus or identification from the name and form, my body, the mind, sense, organs, this personality, this complex is the name and form. And I am usually identified with that, meaning that my feeling of smallness is not because I am small, but because I am identified with what is small. The smallness does exist. The body is small in every way. So are the sense organs. So is the mind. So is the intellect. And the ego is small in every way. However inflated you make it, however large you make it, still he is going to be small. Poor fellow, poor man does not know this. So he keeps on stashing his ego, inflating and inflating, thinking he will become infinite. Cannot. So the identity is not the level of ego. When Upanishad says that you are Brahman, not that this body, mind, sense complex, you, the ego is Brahman. No. When you withdraw your identification from this body, mind, sense, meaning that when you stop judging yourself from the standpoint of this name and form and see yourself as a content that you are. That's why Mano Buddhi Hankara Chitta, I am not the mind, I am not the Buddhi, I am not the Hankara, I am not the Chitta, I am not the various thoughts. Nacha Shrotra Jikwe, Nacha Ghanetre, the five organs of perception I am not, the five elements I am not, the five organs of action I am not, the body I am not. Chidananda Rupa, Shivoham, Shivoham, I am the consciousness, I am Shiva. I am auspiciousness. I am Ayanta. Seeing this fact, or at least recognizing intellectually, put it this way, to begin with. So this, this makes sense. <clears throat> that wave and ocean are not essentially two separate entities. Similarly, Saha, He, and Aham, I, are not essentially two separate entities. The idea of I as a limited entity is the product of ignorance and not a reality about I. Meaning that the sense of smallness or limitedness which I impute upon myself is not the reality about me. It's a habit. So even after understanding in my intellect, I continue to identify. That's habit. The two things. So, we have to change that habit completely. That is where all the efforts are required. The intellectual understanding may not be that difficult. But, to make that intellectual understanding a reality at the level of habit is what requires all the effort. That's what karma, karma, everything is like that. All the yoga is slowly and slowly giving up the habitual error. What is habitual error? Identifying with the body, mind, sense complex. Therefore, Vedanta proposes a whole process of progressively giving up the habitual error. You can't give up right away. You can't right away give up the identification of the body, mind complex. 
Therefore, give up identification with the outcome. Give up identification with action. Give up identification with ego, progressively. Therefore, we were taught Bhakti Yoga, Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga. <coughs> Jnana Yoga is seeing. In other yogas, there is surrender. So, of course, knowledge means ultimate surrender. But in Karma Yoga, surrender is. What is surrender? Ultimate surrender is when I completely surrender my identification with this body mind complex that is called surrendering the ego. And that process of surrendering takes place progressively. As I become prepared for the next stage, then I go step, take step, one step at a time. The we were told, Kayavang Manaha, even the worship also begins with at the level of the body or the limbs. Then slowly progresses to the level of speech, then progresses to the level of mind. So when that identification ultimately is given up, then I see, then non-duality becomes a reality for me. <coughs> Habitual error. So even when I understand, the habit takes over me, and therefore I do not have the benefit of that understanding. To gain the benefit of understanding, I should overcome this habitual error. That is called knowledge. That is called abiding in the knowledge. So in the beginning, this non-duality is a possibility. I understand that that's what it is. I understand that my sense of limitedness or smallness arises from ignorance. Ignorance which causes the identification with the body mind. I know that it is not right. So it will go ultimately. So if you keep on asserting non duality, the duality will go someday. If I keep on asserting duality, it will never go. So we keep on giving reality, duality will never go. So start with giving reality to non duality. Even while functioning in the realm of duality, even by habitually giving reality to duality, but intellectually you do not give reality to duality. Your objective remains to become free from the duality. So, Abhida Bhavana, that attitude of non duality. Even when you meditate, a Lord ultimately want. I know that right now I am meditating as though I am different from you. I know that there is not the reality. I want that this meditation should culminate it into non-duality. Therefore, keeping non-duality as the objective, even while functioning in duality, or even while giving a seeming reality of duality, we have the non-duality as the objective. Abhida bhavana. So bhavana can be attitude. Bhavana can also be anything. But bhavana can be attitude. The attitude of non-duality. The knowledge of non-duality and the attitude of knowledge. Attitude and knowledge are somewhat different. Attitude that this woman is my mother. Then seeing her as my mother. First I begin with the attitude that culminates into knowledge. <coughs> so in meditation there is attitude. In knowledge culminates into knowledge. So Bheda Bhavana, Sohamiti Abhida Bhavana. As compared to the attitude of duality. Soham ki I am that Abhida Bhavana, the attitude of non-duality is Bhavani Mata. Mata is, Mata means considered to be Bhavani purifying. The attitude of non-duality is considered to be purifying as compared to the attitude of duality. Okay, we'll continue. <coughs>
ओम पूर्णमदूर्णमिदम पूर्णात्ूर्णमुगछ्यते पूर्णस्य पूर्णमाय पूर्णमेवशिष्य शाति शाति हरि ओ श्री गुरुभ्यो 